hello, I will not present myself once again. Uh, I'm really happy that today we have here with us Hans Joachim, a friend and a colleague. Uh, he is a professor in modern European studies with special reference to European media culture and the public sphere at the Department of Media Cognition and Communication at the University of Copenhagen. In addition, he is also the coordinator of the Center of European Studies at the Faculty of Humanities and Professor at ARENA, the Center for European Studies at the University of Oslo, Norway. He authored uh, these seven books and published more than 60 articles. The large part of his publication deals with the aspects of media and political communication in Europe, applying a public sphere perspective to the process of European integration and analyzing both print and new media. His writing also addresses questions of language, ethnicity, collective identity, civil society and democracy. Uh, today, uh, coherently with the conference theme, with uh, Hans Joerg, we will talk about the collective mobilization and the new forms of citizens' engagement through social media. Okay, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Irena. Oh. And it's a pleasure being here. This is not one of the parts of Europe where I usually travel, so it is a particular nice opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, here in this maybe not so nice room, it, it, it is at least a, a, some room that is representative for this university. There's even a cat uh, walking over there, I can see. <laughs> and uh, well, I traveled yesterday from Copenhagen, where I work at the Department of Media Cognition and Communication, which actually also combines uh, philosophy. Most of my colleagues are philosophers. Uh, with media and communication uh, studies, which is my competence. I am uh, myself sociologist and, and political scientist, specialized in media and political communication. I'm responsible also for a study which is called Center for Modern European Studies, where we coordinate, uh, it, 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 uh, we coordinate projects and uh, colleagues who work uh, close uh, uh, in the field of European studies. And I'm affiliated uh, with ARENA, which is the Center for European Studies of the University of Oslo. You can probably hear from my accent that I am not Scandinavian, I am actually German. My students always complain that I have a strong German accent. So that, that is my background. And what I'm going to do today is to talk a little bit about a key notion to the study of uh, political engagement and social change. And this is the notion of the public sphere. And uh, I will talk about something that you probably all do uh, every day, and you're all familiar with this, which is that you read political news online. You use uh, internet and social media to read political news. And to various degrees, you engage uh, with news uh, you might do this individually, but also collectively. And my question that I would like to discuss with you today is, what does this mean uh, for democracy? And uh, the topic then is the so-called online public sphere. And I will look at the online public sphere as a space of opinion formation, but also a space of political campaigning, of political engagement, of mobilization. And if you look a little bit back at the debates about uh, this so-called online public sphere, what you find is in the initial years of the internet, there has been a lot of enthusiasm with this idea of uh, carrying political communication forward in, uh, the, uh, through the internet and uh, being more inclusive and participatory towards the citizens. So the idea was that there is a potential actually to create a much better public sphere that is not monopolized uh, by mainstream uh, uh, media. And then um, at the beginning of uh, 2000, 2005, the first kind of critiques of the, uh, uh, the online public sphere um, raised uh, their voice, pointing at some risks and malfunctions. For instance, uh, Cass Sunstein, an American 
um, um, a sociologist and a, a social theorist, he pointed at the problem of the polarization of opinion and the segmentation of uh, communities, of online communities, uh, into what could be called bubbles, uh, the online uh, bubbles. And uh, today, if you look at the debate about the democratic potential of the online public sphere, this kind of skepticism has turned into an overall pessimism. And uh, the social media uh, public communication dynamics are seen actually as a major risk for democracy. They are seen as uh, being responsible for the erosion of civil society, of social cohesion, um, pointing, for instance, at forms of cyberbullying, uh, the presence of hate speech, the debate we have on fake news. In short, they see uh, online media as a kind of danger for the survival of our democracies, introducing uh, what is called sometimes a new post-truth area uh, of kind of manipulated mass electorates. This is the background of my talk today. And I would like to point out to a kind of research framework that would be useful uh, to come up with a response to this question about the democratic potential of the online public sphere. And what I would like to propose here is that we need to understand uh, not only changing patterns of political participation in this online public sphere, but we also need to discuss these changes in relation to uh, the changing ways we actually read news online. This changing news world, news consumption has been transformed in very important ways. And this, first of all, needs to be understood in its impact uh, on democracy before we turn to the question of political participation that might be facilitated by this or not. So um, the question how citizens uh, can be mobilized online is then actually quite closely related uh, to the way uh, citizens are politically informed. And we need to understand, first of all, how they are informed online. So we need to understand uh, how citizens read political news and also how political news are produced then and how they are distributed, how they are shared uh, in this online world before we can turn to the question about um, political uh, engagement. And the digital media revolution is certainly quite dramatically reshaping the political news landscapes of Western societies and we have all the evidence to prove this, and digital interactive media technologies are not only posing a new challenge to the news industries and to professional journalism, they are also affecting the ways citizens take part in political communication. So on the one hand, they are a threat to the survival of journalism, actually, of quality journalism, because nobody is uh, uh, paying uh, for uh, political news. Uh, consumption has uh, become, or there, there is the expectation that news consumption is a kind of uh, good that is available for free. And on the other hand, the way um, uh, readers um, access news um, becomes more and more uh, selective and individualized. And this has, of course, important uh, implications for the traditional assumption of a unitary public sphere that addresses all citizens as equals and talks to them about the same topics at the same time. We can no longer guarantee this uh, in uh, the online uh, news world. So to understand then the democratic implications of the internet, we need to look more closely at this interface of news production and news consumption. And this requires then some research that combines an, inv an investigation of how political news are presented, how they are accessed, how they are read by publics, by citizens, and on the other hand, an investigation how citizens then engage in news. What kind of impact do these news have uh, on public opinion, on individual opinion, attitudes, and uh, following up on this on political uh, engagement. So if you look more closely then as, uh, at social media as a space of political news, what we find, first of all, 
that they have become indeed an important space of news consumption. If you look at uh, audience uh, surveys, what you find is that in particular young people, my students for instance, they would primarily access political news through social media. They no longer read newspapers. They no longer watch TV news, but the only access they have uh, to news as a, as a product that is provided by, by professional journalists is through social media, through the selective kind of news that are shared within uh, their groups uh, on Facebook or on Twitter. And What we also know is that they only selectively and occasionally read political news. And this is a pattern that holds for all Western uh, societies, for the younger generations. On the other hand, we also know that there are more active ways to engage with news for them, if they choose to. So a clear advantage uh, of political news online is that citizens can actually engage with them, and they can engage in various ways. Engagement is also the topic of this conference, I understand, so I will certainly come back to these forms of political uh, engagement uh, with news that are facilitated by social media. And the most engaged form is probably called participatory journalism, which is that uh, citizens can also make news. They can uh, contribute to a better journalism. They can break the monopole uh, of the established news industries and uh, uh, they can uh, produce uh, what is sometimes called also alternative news or raise also alternative news agendas. On the other hand, journalism is of course a, a profession and we talk of professional uh, journalism and the question then is how professionals uh, are actually citizens uh, who make these news. Then, on the other hand, social media are a space of political campaigning, not only of uh, news reading, of news reception, but also of active political engagement. And political campaigns are increasingly fought online. So the, uh, the social media space also becomes the main arena uh, for political campaigning. No longer the streets, we had this morning the discussion whether the streets are still uh, important uh, for the expression of political uh, protest. Uh, at least uh, when it comes, for instance, to electoral campaigns, uh, the social media space has become dominant uh, in most Western countries. This is maybe not so problematic as long as we know that when we move on social media, we are part of such campaigns. So if I visit, for instance, on Facebook, the, and the, the Facebook side of a political party, I know, of course, that this party uh, produces political content um, uh, in, um, uh, that is meant for campaigning. And um, the problem here, however, is that campaigning sites and news sites are increasingly interwoven. If you look, for instance, how the Brexit campaign has been run in the UK, uh, you will find that uh, that very popular campaigning sites with millions uh, of, um, of uh, people following uh, these sites are half news uh, sites, half sites where uh, more political posts uh, were shared. So we no longer uh, can really distinguish between what is news and what, is, uh, and what are political posts meant for campaigning. And we find this even more so in the US uh, if you look at uh, Breitbart news and the use of uh, fake news uh, by political campaigners. And this is also not so new, uh, uh, you could argue, because we had a kind of partisan press uh, also uh, before uh, in uh, Western societies, which means newspapers that were run by political parties. Um, today online we observe maybe a kind of return of the partisan press. For instance, Breitbart News in the UK, or even Fox News in the UK, uh, could be seen as a new uh, partisan press. And then there is the discussion on uh, what could be called data-driven campaigns. This could be a third form of uh, campaigning through social media. And this was uh, quite recently in uh, the news with Cambridge Analytica. And I took this here from the website of Cambridge Analytica, where they kind of advertised themselves with this slogan, we find your voters and move them to action. 
And as we have seen uh, in this recent uh, kind of scandal, uh, is that they actually do this quite efficiently. And you could ask, isn't this a breach in a fair political competition game? Most would probably argue that this is a breach in a fair political competition game, but why actually? So in a fair political competition game, you would argue that a political campaign is meant to reach out, of course, with content that convinces political adherents, but maybe also reaches out to some opponents and convinces uh, people who were not uh, prone uh, to vote for this particular party. What is a convincing strategy of political cam uh, campaigning and what is a strategy that aims at manipulation has, however, always been quite difficult to disentangle. So we don't know exactly what is, uh, uh, what is a fair campaign and what is a campaign that aims at the manipulation of audiences, especially if you look at election campaigns. And in this case, we have to do with election campaigns that are data-driven on social media, which means in practice that content can be targeted. So as a spin doctor working for a political party, you can design particular content and distribute this among uh, particular user groups or individuals that become your kind of strategic targets. And I would say that this in itself is not so unusual because this is what every campaign uh, does. Uh, and what is rather unique in this Cambridge Analytica case is the way, of course, campaigners can, um, or uh, the way that campaigners have gathered the information and the knowledge. So the data uh, that they use um, for campaigning um, has been used in a half legal uh, or, or even illegal way and uh, considers uh, breaches in terms of data protection from our understanding. Um, it would empower, of course, the political parties that can make use of it, and they are spin doctors, and disempower the voters. And uh, the, this was precisely what we could observe in the Trump elections uh, in the US, and most likely also in uh, the Brexit uh, vote in the UK two years ago. But um, you could also argue the following, that if you apply this model of data-driven campaigns in a very sophisticated way, what you could, uh, what you could kind of imagine then is a, form of political is a form of political communication, of campaigning, that is entirely taken over by machines. So machines would tailor political content. And uh, I come myself from a school of deliberative uh, democracy, and as a deliberative theorist in democracy, I certainly don't like this idea of machines uh, producing political content. But on the other hand, I must also acknowledge that this is done in a very efficient way. And machines are often actually more reliable uh, and maybe even more honest uh, communicators uh, than humans are. So you could even imagine Facebook to kind of democratize this model of digital campaigning. If they would give equal access to all political parties, to all companions of this data, you would have created a situation of equality. Um, and uh, if you guarantee at the same time that the data is used in an anonymous way, uh, you could turn this into a fair form of uh, political uh, campaigning that does not necessarily, uh, from my normative understanding, damage um, uh, democracy. Yeah, but this is maybe a kind of utopia, or it is a spectra also, of machine-driven digital democracy. So I'm, I'm not going further into detail this, and I will rather turn now to the reality uh, of social media political interactions, and also look at the ways social media users then actually talk about political news online. And you could ask, first of all, why is commenting on political news on social media, a form of political participation. Is this what we traditionally understand as political engagement? And I guess that your understanding of political engagement, you would find reasons to contest this assumption. 
And um, user commenting on political news, I think, can be considered as a kind of light form of political engagement through which readers of news are given an opportunity to contribute in various ways uh, to political news, to the informative value of news, but then they also interpret news, they contribute also to the dissemination of news, for instance, uh, to sharing practices uh, on social media, and finally they have the opportunity to enter into conversation with other readers, with other users on social media, uh, and this conversation has a particular purpose, which we can call public opinion formation in the first place, but in the second place, this conversation can lead to uh, forms of political mobilization, to lobbying, uh, to pressuring government, uh, whatever. So from this perspective then, a user commenting can be categorized as a light form or as a latent form of political participation. And through online media, citizens can get involved in politics. This happens in often more subtle ways than uh, political participation as we traditionally understand it. And these latent forms of participation, they would then encompass activities such as reading about political information, discussing political issues online, they can join groups that, that advocate particular, uh, particular causes on social media, they can also share politically related uh, interests, and I guess we all do this to some degree. And this is relevant, of course, from, a, uh, from the perspective of individual users, of individuals, but these users also are citizens of uh, uh, some polity, of some state, uh, of some country, uh, they define themselves as uh, uh, participating in a process of a political opinion and a will formation. So the interesting then is how uh, they go from the individual to the collective. There is a kind of aggregative effect. So single users, they of course only engage very selectively and they do not necessarily invest much time and much resources uh, in reading political news. But still, there has been a kind of demonstrable effect on citizens' political opinions and behavior. They contribute in uh, quite uh, substantial ways to processes of uh, political opinion uh, formation. And if you look at the debate about what kind of public sphere emerges out of this, um, the kind of optimist here, and I quote a colleague from Lund University, Peter Dahlgren, he talks of the online civic sphere, where he uh, detects a kind of participatory logic, and uh, for him uh, there is a potential uh, for citizens to raise their voice directly uh, in politics on a public forum. This would be inclusive, it could give the opportunity to minorities, to otherwise marginalized voices uh, to express uh, their voice, uh, um, and it could emphasize a difference instead of mainstream opinions that are maybe kind of emphasized uh, by mainstream media. There could be even a kind of critical public that is seen as an avant-garde of general publics. This is the old notion of uh, subaltern uh, publics, or however you would like to call them they would have the possibility, the chance uh, to, um, to constitute themselves and then later uh, to mobilize uh, through uh, um, online and social media. And overall, you could also discuss the relationship of representation um, of these kind of avant-garde publics or critical publics to the general public um, in the way they express popular discontent that stands for broader kind of interests or concerns in society. So they express concerns that are representative uh, for some parts of the uh, population. So it's a form of interest representation also. And we also have examples, um, uh, some colleagues talk about media morality here, um, uh, how media are used um, to support uh, particular causes, for instance, uh, uh, campaigns, 
Uh, I was myself, for instance, analyzing solidarity campaigns with refugees, uh, how a particular morality then uh, is mobilized uh, through uh, social media in support of uh, particular groups that are in need of our assistance, for instance, in, in case of humanitarian disaster or whatever. Yeah, and lastly, uh, the assumption is that all this uh, is maybe not, uh, it is maybe not representative uh, for what we call public opinion, but it certainly shapes public opinion in important ways. Now, this was a lot of optimism, and I come to the more pessimistic uh, voice here, which is that uh, there's a kind of populist logic at play, and that these online spheres turn into very uncivic spheres. And also we find a lot of uh, evidence that, that, that would support this cyber pessimist assumption that a civil society sphere of participation would require personal relations, that people meet actually, or that people organize protests in the streets. And it requires people to interact, uh, to stand for each other, to build trust relations. And this is certainly not guaranteed by the, anonymity, by the anonymity of people who meet online. They would rather undermine uh, trust relationships. And especially social media then are seen as being dominated by commercial logics. The social media space uh, does also not belong to citizens. If you look at Facebook, this is owned by a powerful American company. And it follows a, an entirely capitalist a logic of profit, not of enhancing democracy, but of making profit. So Facebook is not your friend, as Facebook uh, claims uh, itself, but Facebook actually exploits you in many ways. And this then would lead to communication dynamics that are detrimental to civil society and they are detrimental to democracy. For instance, Debates are not just critical, but often they are found to be overall negative or anti-democratic or populist, following a populist logic. So the crowd dominates over the rational voice. And one example I can give here would be cyberbullying. And you, and you can become an easy prey of cyberbullying. Not only minorities, but also professors of universities, by the way women, schools, academics, elites, intellectual elites. Some claim that the social media turn into the toilet wall of the internet where uh, people post their stupid comments. Uh, hate speech, sexist language, racist and extremist. Now the question is, how can we decide between these two scenarios, the optimists and the pessimists? How can we actually measure online discussions? And there what I will do in the remaining time, how much time do I have left, by the way? Some time left, yes. <laughs> you will make me a sign uh, when I talk too long. What I want to do in the remaining part is to talk a little bit about some research I have conducted myself where I address these questions and I can come with an empirically informed uh, uh, measurement here. And um, there are different aspects here. The first is that we can certainly not, uh, uh, from a more deliberative perspective of democracy, use the same measurement that we have developed uh, in the past to measure the quality uh, of uh, deliberative democracy and the quality of uh, participation uh, uh, of civil society in an offline uh, world. We need to have some new criteria. For instance, instead of discursivity in terms of discursive interactions and rational arguments, what is maybe more appropriate is to use a term which is called connectivity. Uh, it has been used by a colleague of mine from the Netherlands, uh, uh, Van Dijk. Um, connectivity, it means that there is a web of meaning um, and um, you can contribute in uh, various uh, ways to this. And connecting means then 
that um, you can, of course, be responsive uh, to content, but um, this responsiveness uh, is often um, kind of sequential, uh, but not necessarily inter um, um, it is not necessarily manifested in interactive um, speech acts. So this is not exactly uh, discursivity in a Habermasian sense, but it would encompass uh, also other forms, like for instance uh, passive um, forms um, of, uh, of interacting with media content, which would be on social media uh, clicking, liking particular content, sharing it, um, which is a way to contribute to making content salient. Uh, selectively a uh, saying, of course, sharing it uh, with your friends, which also shows that you find this content relevant. And then more active uh, forms here uh, that can be analyzed, which is that you can uh, use speech actually to, um, uh, 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 to interact with media content or with journalistic news. You can uh, use it for mobilization purposes, you can approve or disapprove, you can express anger and frustration. You can also actively support particular candidates, and all this would drive then political discussions uh, online. And what I will do then is to summarize a little bit what do we know about online civic engagement. I will look first at the actors. Who is it actually who comments online? And this regards the question of representation of the online voice. Are these only the angry citizens uh, who raise their voice online, or can this be considered to be representative for public opinion? Then secondly, I would like to understand how do these uh, people comment? Do they comment in a civic way, or are there many uh, non-civic elements, like cyberbullying, hate, and so forth? And then the third question is, what impact does this have for political legitimacy. So who do they support if they do this? And I have conducted some research on this in three related projects. I will shortly mention this here. If you are interested in one of these projects, you can also ask me directly and approach me uh, later today. Uh, one would be, um, or one is uh, the Media Negativity Project. This is a project where we uh, measured um, actually news content on mainstream newspapers uh, for negativity, whether there is a negativity bias in uh, news provided by journalists. And then we looked how these news became amplified uh, through social media and in online commenting forums, and we analyzed whether this negativity bias in political news uh, was amplified um, uh, through social media. So whether citizens are even more negative uh, than uh, journalists are. The second is uh, the Prexel project, where we looked at the relationship between online news forums uh, in which Brexit uh, or EU membership was debated, and then online campaigning sites, uh, these campaigning sites that were run by the pro-Brexiters and anti-Brexiters uh, on Facebook and on Twitter. And we were interested in the question whether the pro-Brexiters and anti-Brexiters were completely segmented publics and lived in completely, in completely different news worlds, or whether they actually engaged in debates with each other. And the third is a project which I actually uh, I wrote the final report only uh, this week. Uh, I finished it yesterday before uh, entering the plane. And this is uh, the European Solidarity Project where we look at um, uh, news claims making in relation to online commenting in response to the so-called refugee crisis that took place in 2015. Uh, and we analyzed these debates in comparison with eight European countries. There is a website where you find further information uh, on this. The project is called Transol. It's the Horizon 2020 project. So, coming now to some selective findings, one that might be of interest for you is very simple. It's the question, who comments in terms of gender? Would you expect that there is a gender gap in terms of those people who comment uh, on social media news sites? And you will be maybe not surprised to hear that there is a considerable gender gap. 
First of all, um, there's a majority of users who choose gender neutral uh, usernames. So they uh, choose to uh, comment in anonymity and they choose a, a, a gender neutral names. But among those whose gender can be identified, we find that the great majority are males. So 80% of those that can be identified with gender are males. Below 20% uh, are females. And this holds for mainstream newspapers commenting sites in Germany and in the UK. Same a relationship in both countries. So there's a considerable gender gap and uh, some claim that only the angry old men uh, raise voice uh, on uh, uh, in these commenting sites and our findings in a way point into this direction, yes. And um, this is also confirmed by the newspapers themselves who have published uh, data on uh, the um, uh, on uh, the uh, uh, commenters, uh, there is a survey that is published by The Guardian in the UK and they reported that indeed um, uh, it is 75% uh, they found that uh, of the users are male. Uh, 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 the same uh, was reported by Washington Post and the same was also reported by New York Times. So 75% of the people who engage with news there are males. And the Guardian survey also reported that abuses of netiquette, so when people are punished for abusing the netiquette, are most often uh, done by males and directed towards females. So if there is a female journalist writing, there are much more abuses of netiquette than if male journalists are writing. The same also if the journalist belongs to a minority. If the journalist is uh, black, there are much more uses uh, of the netiquette. Then in the case of female readers, if they abstain then from commenting, this is of course then also explained by this rather harsh climate in user commenting forums. And there is one uh, female reader of the Washington Post. She puts it precisely like this, and I think she has a good point. Rather, I don't comment on websites for the same reason I don't watch wrestling or go to strip clubs or do any number of other things that men statistically do far more than women. I think it's stupid and I'm not into it. So, are these then also the angry citizens who comment? The angry old man, as I said before? Well, um, this is not so clear in our data. But it seems to be the case that the social media are definitely used to express political discontent. There is an overall negativity uh, in the way uh, political representatives are assessed. And there is also a kind of radicalization of opinion that more extremist opinion gains salience in these uh, social media news sites. And there is also, as we can find, a quite disproportionate number of supporters of right-wing extremist parties uh, expressing their opinion in these groups. Um, this does not mean that debates are not balanced. They are balanced to a certain degree, but these groups are clearly overrepresented uh, in social media news sites. I should come to an end. Is this correct? Yes, I will do this. And um, the next question then would be about civicness. And here I have two indicators. One is that we uh, measure this connectivity. Do they actually engage in news content? And the second is, do they show respect to each other or, or, or do they engage in hate speech? And I will do this quickly. In terms of connectivity, we actually have positive findings to report, which means that uh, the commenters do engage with, com uh, with content that is provided by journalists. They refer to the topics of the debate, and often they also respond to some claims that have been raised by political actors in the news. So it's not that they talk about anything, they, are, uh, they discuss within uh, the context of debates that have been uh, kind of triggered on social media. 
More interesting are the findings in, uh, on civicness. Do they actually show mutual respect to each other? And um, here I should make a caveat maybe that Facebook and Twitter users do, not, uh, do also not need to like each other all the time. And uh, maybe there's even too much liking going on on Facebook. If you are active on Facebook, you strive, of course, for being liked all the time. Uh, but um, maybe a user commenting uh, should be also used in a more critical way, uh, as long as this is articulated uh, in a kind of appropriate language. And um, so I only analyze here whether I actually engage in hate speech. And, um, and what I mean with hate speech is a speech that kind of preaches the netiquette. So um, it is whenever a speech that attacks a person or a group on a basis of particular attributes uh, such as race, religion, <coughs> ethnic origin, sexual orientation, disability, or gender. And here, what we find is that there is actually not much hate speech. Uh, on social media. It is not frequent at all. In our sample, it was almost absent, and we were surprised about the absence of hate speech because everybody talks about hate speech, so we expected to find a lot of hate speech. We didn't find it, so we looked at other data, and as a matter of fact, also The Guardian, in their survey, they report that 2% of users on The Guardian have been blocked uh, for hate speech. This is not that much, 2%. Of course, if you look over time, 2% then amounts to 1.4 million comments that they had uh, to, uh, uh, to control. So 1.4 million comments for someone who moderates debates is still a lot to moderate. But in terms of kind of percentage, it is not that much. And um, we can speculate why hate speech is absent. And uh, it has to do with the fact, of course, that there is moderation. Uh, on Facebook, there are also legal responsibilities. Uh, Germany has just passed a Facebook law that actually punishes uh, Facebook if they don't block uh, hate speech. Uh, there, is all, uh, uh, there are also forms of efficient self-regulation of online forums. And uh, we should not forget also that engaging in hate speech on social media is a high-risk strategy. I would, not, uh, I would not recommend any of you to do this on social media because you risk to be defriended if you do. So you risk to be marginalized if you uh, actually engage in um, uh, hate speech. There are, of course, also efficient forms of uh, control uh, by uh, the state and by the police. OK, I understand that I should come to the end. Um, uh, I have some more data uh, on legitimacy, where I look at who is actually supported uh, in terms of political parties on social media. Do they support, for instance, the European Union if they uh, in debates about the EU? And the answer is, in short, uh, no. They reject the EU. There is only this very small minority of comments who support the EU. Does this mean that they support the, uh, uh, their national government? And no. To the same degree that they reject the EU, they also re uh, reject their national government. Does this mean they like the, the opposition in their country? a little bit more than the national government, but still, they also reject the opposition. So who do they like? Well, look at the um, populist right-wing parties. They are the ones that are most liked. Not that they love them, but, but if there is a chance that they approve a political party position, it's a party position by right-wing and populist parties. Well, this is the picture. And in conclusion, how I have called this, I have called this then a form of a participatory um, populism. There is an adoption of populist style in these online commenting forums. There is a form of populism in the media through the salience of the populist actors. They are disproportionately salient at the populist parties. And there's a populism through the media that is expressed in online uh, comments. So the online commenters adopt such a populist style, and um, they develop also a self-understanding. We are here to represent the people. We raise the people's voice against the elite, which is precisely the populist uh, logic. 
This is not steered by political parties. There is actually a surprising absence of, um, of uh, leaders, of populist leaders in this online commenting world. It's a leaderless or, or, or participatory populism. And this hopefully gives some uh, food for thought and for discussion. And I will stop here. Thank you.